Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. Our desire is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the nations. We hope that you find this message powerful and impacting. If you would like to contact us, you can email us at info at allpeopleschurch.ca. If you would like to support us, you can go to our website at allpeopleschurch.ca and click on the red Give Online button in the top right-hand corner. Well, get ready for a life-changing word. The older I get, you know, I, I kind of honor persistence. I, I've learned a long time ago that persistence is better than talent. I, I believe you can wear the devil out. <laughs> and when I think of Pastor Tony and Pastor Carolyn, there's one thing about them. They have been here. We, we talked earlier. It was since 19 what? 83. They've been in this church when, when they, they served another man of God and work for another man of God. They've been committed to this place since 1983. I honor that about you. You are one persistent couple. You don't give up, you don't back down. Come on, let's really put our hands together for that. That's awesome. I often say persistence produces prosperity. Passivity creates poverty. So it's very important, persistence. Everybody say persistence. Let me tell you, you don't have to be smart, you don't have to be good looking, you don't have to be super talented, but if you'll just be persistent, you'll eventually get your breakthrough. Do you believe that? Say, oh yes. yes. Well, March 16, 2001, that was the worst day of my entire life. Hey, how many of you had some bad days? Have you had some bad days? Yeah, that, that was a really bad day for me. I experienced a mental, emotional, spiritual and total financial devastation. As a matter of fact, I was $180,000 in credit card debt. How I many of you know that's, that's, that's bad, right? And, and I, I remember looking at my bills, my stack of bills, and looking at my bank account, and, and realizing I had no money to pay for these bills, and I had to go to my wife and tell her, we gotta sell everything we have. I mean, that was a, that was a painful moment for me, and, I said, we got to sell everything, and we did. We sold everything we had, and I had to move into my mother-in-law's 12 by 12 bedroom. I mean, how many know that that's hell on earth, right? <laughs> I, I mean, some of you should cheer up. You should smile. You're not in your mother-in-law's house. Come on now, huh? <laughs> Life could be worse. Whenever you get feeling down, just say, thank God I'm not living with my mother-in-law, right? But hey, if you're living with your mother-in-law, you came to the right church service tonight. I'm going gu to guarantee you that. But, but I remember inside knowing that in that moment, in my darkest moment, I knew inside that God had a great future for me. I, I, I knew inside that I was supposed to travel the world, that I was supposed to speak to thousands of people. I, I knew inside I was supposed to be a best-selling author, that, that God's word promised me cycles of success, that, that God wanted to bless me, that God wanted to prosper me. How many of you know that about your life? Say, oh, yes. I, I knew it inside, but when I looked at my life, nothing like that was happening. And in that moment, I experienced what we all experience. I experienced the pain of unleashed potential. Everybody say that word, potential. Potential, potential is not who you are right now. It's who you could be. Potential is not what we're doing right now. It's what we could be doing. Potential is not what we have right now. It, it's not the amount of money we're making now. It's not the size of the home we have now. It's not the kind of car we have now. It's not how much money we have in the bank right now, but it's what? It's how much we could have in the future. And we all know that material possessions isn't everything there is to life. Can you say, oh, yes? But we all know that making a difference is the best thing, right? That knowing our life impacted other people's lives. And, and so uh, we all know that we could be helping more. We want to help people. Is that right about you? And I wanted to help people. I, I wanted to, my life to count. But at that moment, nothing was happening. I, I experienced that gap between where I was and where I knew I was designed by God to be. And in that moment, I experienced the pain, and tears started to come down my face. 
and snot started to come out of my nose. Let me tell you, I did not look as pretty as I looked this morning. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you that right now. It was one ugly moment. Now, 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 ladies, ladies, you can cry pretty easy, right? I mean, a woman can cry pretty easy, but but a man. Now, ladies, you know, if your man cries, what, what comes into your mind? Uh-oh. Right? And I, I learned a long time ago, if you want to get out of any problems, guys, just cry. Because <laughs> no matter how mad my wife is, if I start crying, she'll go, oh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's a great strategy. <laughs> but ladies, you know when a man cries, he's in what? He's in deep pain. How many of you guys ever cried? Do you remember a moment when you cried, guys? Yeah, you were in deep pain, weren't you? Yeah, I was in deep pain because of my unleashed potential. I didn't know how to unleash it. I knew I had it. I didn't know how to unleash it. And now here I am. I'm stuck in my mother-in-law's house. I'm stuck in hell. And how many know when you're in hell, you want to get out fast? When you know you're somewhere you don't want to belong, you want to get out, and you want to get out fast. I remember flying one day. I was flying from Singapore, coming back into the United States, and we were landing in Los Angeles, and we had to circle Los Angeles. We're, we're supposed to land. I kind of had to go to the bathroom, but I thought, no, we're going to land, and I'll, I'll wait, and I'll get off the plane, and I'll, I'll go. But we're all buckled up, right? And now we have to circle the the. The, the place because of the storms. They say, stay buckled up. Don't get up. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> oh, okay. And, and when the plan lanes, right, I, I am beelining it towards the, towards the bathroom. And I'm going, I'm going. I'm like, oh, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. <laughs> and I go into the bathroom. Now, we're in L.A. You don't know what to expect to see in L.A., right? And I go into the bathroom. And I, when I walk in the bathroom, all of a sudden, out of this stall comes this, I mean, this tall, that I'm six foot six, and it, and it was a woman. And my first thought was, I know they have some weird people over here. Maybe, you know, maybe this is a he, she. I don't know. And, and, but but I started to look around, and I, I realized all of a sudden, oh wait a minute, I am in the wrong restroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh no! And, and, and I said, I gotta what? I gotta. Get out of here. And guess what? I got out of that restroom as fast as I, as I could. See, when you're in the wrong place, you want to get out really fast. But if you stay long enough in a wrong place, you'll settle for where you're at. But in my mother-in-law's house, there was one thing. I knew I was not designed and created by the creator to live in hell. Most people I find in, in life are more satisfied with a known hell than living in a known, known heaven. So they stay stuck where they're at instead of going for where they're supposed to go. And, and I know in my own life at that stage, I, I, was, I was hurting so bad and everything around me looked like just bad, not good. But I realized some things because Crisis is the gift from God that when it comes into your life, it doesn't look like a gift, but it is because what we call a crisis, God calls a classroom and it's in the middle of our crisis. We do, our real beliefs begin to surface about ourselves. and what I, what I discovered in that tough time of mine, I, I discovered that I had some wrong beliefs that People had taught me some wrong things over the years, and most of the wrong teaching came from church. That I had got, I'd, I'd gained some wrong beliefs that actually caused me to end up in hell. Now, your belief systems that you have in your life are the sail that moves you into your future. And so you have to be careful with belief systems. And what I learned is most of us, as far as our finances go, we learn from wrong people. I mean, my, my own self, how did I learn about money? How did I learn about prosperity? I, 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 I learned the wrong way. My family, they, they, they abused their money, right? 
Poverty is not the proof of lack of money. Poverty is the proof you've been spending money in the wrong places. My, my, my parents made lots of money. My father made lots of money. But guess what? He spent it on wrong things. And so I, and so I, I realized, wow, I learned about finances. The reason why I'm in a financial crisis, I learned about finances from my poor parents. And if you think about it, who do, who do we learn about this stuff from? We learn from our poor parents. We learn from, we go to school and we learn from poor teachers. And then we go to church and we learn from poor. <laughs> and guess what that produces? A bunch of poor people. So poor teaching poor equals more poor. And so if you're gonna learn about, especially about money, hey, I wanna give you a piece of advice. Don't listen to people who teach about money who are broke. Go learn about money from people who have succeeded and then do what they do. Can you say, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I realized in that moment, wow, my belief systems got me here. And I, I said, man, I need help. I need some help. So, so I reached for somebody to help me. And fortunately, I, I got a great coach that came into my life. And I, I went to go see him, and I'll never forget. He looked at me, and he says, he says so tell me. You know, what, what's going on for your future? Where, where, where are you heading? Where are you going? <laughs> and I looked at him, and, and back then, you know, uh, I was conditioned by the church to think yearly, right? And so I says, well, well, this year's gonna be my year of breakthrough. He's like, your year of breakthrough? Yeah, this, this year's gonna be the, my year of breakthrough. Last year was the year of favor, but this year's going to be the year of breakthrough. And I don't even know with the church. I mean, every year we got this little slogan, right, of what this year is going to be. And, and, and the guy looked at me and, and said, he says, why are you thinking so small? I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> he, he, said, he said, why are you only thinking about a year? He said, that's small thinking. He says, why don't you think about the next decade? Why don't you think about the next 10 years of your life of where you're going to be? I'm like, wow, I, I never thought about that before. And he said, he's like, well, if you'd start thinking, you'd be a lot further along in life. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's, 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 that's true. And, and this guy just started filleting me. I mean, I mean he, he's like, well, do you, do you have your dreams and your goals written out on paper? I'm like, no, you know, I, I just, I pray every day. He says, you pray every day? I says, yeah. I says, every day I just pray, God, your will be done in my life. He said, that's all you pray, God's will be done in your life. He said, I said, I said, yes, you better believe it. Every day, God, your will be done. He says, you are an idiot. I'm like, I, I didn't pay you $250 for you to call me an idiot. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's not a prayer of faith. That's a prayer of consecration. I'm like, what? He said, yeah. He said, when you pray the Lord's will be done, that's a prayer of Jesus consecrating his life to the Father, saying, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. That's a prayer of consecration. You're in hell, Bubba. I'm like, yeah, I'm in hell. He said, what you need right now is a prayer that moves mountains. You need me to, you need God to radically change your life. I'm like, yes, I do. Well, the prayer of consecration is not going to work for you. He said, man, you need this prayer of faith going on in your life. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, I, I never saw it that way. He said, yeah, you, you, you need to really start looking at your life. And instead of living life by default, you need to start living life by design. And I'm like, wow. And, I, and I, I'm like, he, and this guy said, he said, Keith, he says, you are the co-creator of your future. You and God together are creating the future that you want. I started to think about that. I'm learning, man. I'm like, what? I, I just thought God was just going to make it all happen for me. What, you know, if God's going to do it, God will just do it. How, how many have ever said prayers like that before? Yeah, God's just going to do it. I mean, and if we, if we, I thought that way before, and if you think that way, it's like, well, if God wants you to comb your hair, he's going to come down and comb your hair for you. How many know God's not going to come down and comb your hair? He's not going to put deodorant on you. 
He's not going to put you in the shower. Whose responsibility is it to comb your hair? Whose responsibility is it for you to put deodorant on? And to brush your teeth? Whose responsibility is it? Everybody say, it's mine. <laughs> so I was, I was wanting God to do for me what I was supposed to be doing myself. Wow. And, and I, I'm, like, I'm like, wow, that, that is a completely new thought. For me, it, it was it was life transforming, and and I started to think, because uh, because I went to the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Isn't that a good great way to start? <laughs> let's just start all over again. Everybody say, let's just start all over again. <laughs> yeah, is it possible some things that we've learned in the past? This all sounds good, but it's not true. It's not everything that we need, and so I went back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says what? In the beginning. Okay, we, we need to go back to class. How, many, how long have you guys been going to church, huh? Let's go. Hey, in the beginning, God what? I can't hear you. What was God doing? So the very first verse in the Bible, how many of you know that must be an important verse to God? I mean, if he's going to open up a whole book, and talk about himself, the first sentence probably we really should pay close attention to. In the beginning, what was God doing? He was what? Creating. Creating. So he chooses to reveal himself as a creator. Why? Because he wants us to understand who we are. See, the more we get to know God, the more we discover who we really are. God says, I want you to know I am creator because you are a creator. Wow. And when I started, my eyes started to open up to that to realize I've got a responsibility to create my future. Therefore, because God gave me the ability to create, I now have a responsibility I am no longer a victim, no matter how bad my life was, no matter how negative my life story is. And Pastor Tony told you, my life story is full of being abused, being beaten, being an alcoholic, not being able to read, not being able to write. Everything in life was against me. I was an abused little boy who couldn't read, couldn't write, insecure, thought I was stupid, thought I was ugly, thought I was a failure in life. That was not the most greatest place to be raised. And however, no matter how bad it's been for you, as long as you have the ability to create, you have the ability to change your life. Come on, let's put our hands together. Are you hearing me? Yes, you do. In the beginning, let's say that. Why can't today begin a new beginning for you? You can begin, you can draw a line today and say, you know what? When I look at my life, it stinks. I have settled for a life that's far below what God has for me. And at some point, you got to draw the line and say, you know what? The past is the past. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It is my past. And now I'm going to leave my past behind, and I'm stepping over the line, and I'm going to create a new future that's way better than my past. My brother, every time I get with my brother, we both grew up in the same home. Both of us. He's living in the ghetto in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm living in the penthouse. Hell, (laughs) penthouse in Tampa, Florida. Paradise. Two boys, same conditions, same house, same parents. One boy ends up in paradise. The other boy ends up in hell. And you know what the difference is? 
It's not that he's smarter, more talented. As a matter of fact, my brother is so smart, he can quote the whole book of Revelations from Revelations 1 to the end. It's not that he's not smarter, he's not better looking than me, but he is smarter. And, but watch this, watch this. Every time I get with my brother, every time I get with my brother, he's always talking about how bad it was when we were raised, how terrible our mother was, how, how, how horrible his life was, and all the abuse, and all the stories of all the stuff that happened. And, and I'm going to tell you, when, 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 at 23 years old, I, I looked at my life. My life was a mess. And you know what I said? I said, I'm getting out of here. And I called my grandparents. I said, come pick me up. They said, what do you mean, come pick you up? I, they were going to Florida. I lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they were going to Florida. I said, come pick me up. I'm getting away from my friends. They're losers. I'm getting away from the drug addicts. I'm getting away from that old life. And I'm getting out of this state, and I'm moving to Florida. Take me down. And I left my past in the past, and I started dreaming of a new future for my life. I made my dream of the future so huge. It was what? It was huge, as Bernie would say. I made it so big that I forgot. I forgot. My dream healed my pain of my past because I got so consumed with moving to my dream, I forgot. Now every time I get with him, I, 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 I get depressed. I have to take Prozac before I meet with him because he always wants to drag me where? He wants to drag me in my memory when I'm trying to live life out of my imagination. And see, you will either live a life out of your imagination or you're going to live life stuck in the memories of the past. Well, ladies and gentlemen, your past is designed for photo books, not for your future. You store those back in there and you put them in a closet and lock them up and set fire to them. <laughs> and you got to go into your future. Because looking at the past isn't getting you anywhere. So in the beginning, God did what? God created. The beginning of creativity starts with imagination. Let's all say that word, imagination. imagination. The root word is image, imagine, image, maker. Between your two ears, come on, just go like this for me, would you? Say right between my two ears is a factory. This factory pictures. Your brain has the ability to take a picture and look beyond where you're at to see a future of the divine possibilities of what could be for your life. You have a responsibility because God gave you a gift. Everybody say it's a gift. Out of everything God created, he didn't give Thing else, this thing called imagination. Only you have it. The sun cannot create because it has no imagination. Now, everything God created, He created to reproduce after its own kind. Did you get that? So, meaning the, the sun can produce light, but the sun cannot create. Nothing and make it something. The animals don't have an imagination. They reproduce. A deer can produce a deer, but a deer cannot produce a cow. Right or right? Flowers. Flowers do not have an imagination. They can reproduce the same kind of flower, but a lily cannot produce an orchid. They can only reproduce after themselves. God said, wait a minute, I'm going to create because I love myself so much. I'm going to create some people who can be just like me. Come on, are you with me? So I am the creator and you are a creator. Oh, somebody needs to help me right there. 
And you are designed and engineered inside of you. God created you and fashioned you with the tools to succeed, with the tools to create a fantastic life, with the tools to do something on this earth so big that other people look at your life and go, wow, wow. She was a prostitute. Wow, look what she did. She, she, was, she, she was destined to never succeed, but wow, look what he did. He, I, I know where he came from. Wow, look what he did. God wants your life to wow other people. And he gave you this thing, imagination. Everybody say imagination. imagination. The ability to take your mind and to go into the future and to see the divine possibilities of what could be. This coach, for me, he, he told me, he says, he said, Keith, he says, I want to challenge you. And I, I says, okay. He says, uh, he says, because you're not really clear, I want to challenge you. And that's what coaches do. Ch coaches challenge people to get out of their comfort zone. And what I realized was that no matter what, I was creating whether I liked it or not. Come on. See, you can sit here today and say, well, I don't believe this stuff, and I don't know about all this stuff, and you know, I'm just going to go back and just trust God, just trust God. And I don't know about all this stuff. And, and you can reject it. But you know what? No matter how much you reject this message, you're still going to go and continue to create your life. You have created your own environment whether you like it or not. You have a choice. You can create either or. You can create a heaven or you can create a hell. Most people would rather live in a known hell than to create an unknown heaven. But God originally created you for paradise. Let's say that together. God, God. created me created. for paradise. paradise. Somebody say, oh, yeah. Yeah, what was God's desire? God did not put Adam in hell. He put Adam in a place of paradise. Adam got kicked out, and God's been trying to get us back to paradise ever since. But what do humans tend to do? We tend to want to function inside of our comfort zone. And inside of your comfort zone, you conform to the masses. The masses are broke. The masses are underachievers. The masses are lazy. The masses are going to sit at home and watch football games today and hockey games. The masses, they should be building a business. They should be building a life. But the masses are going to sit and watch the Olympic games. The masses are going to sit and watch the baseball game. And, and then they're going to wear their jersey with their favorite baseball player on the back and think they're cool not realizing they're really a dork. Why would you want to wear somebody else's name on your back? They only do that in prison. Come on. Hello. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you something. Your favorite baseball player, your favorite basketball player, they're not going to wear your name on their back. That's right. That's right. And they're not going to give you any money for the return ticket that you, that you went and spent all that money on. They're going to take that money and go buy their mansions and their limousines and leave you broke. Won't you go home tonight, take all those jerseys, go out and set them on fire and dance on top of them, and then go and make your own jersey, put your own name on the back and say, I am bad to the bone. <laughs> Touch your neighbor say, stop being a dork. Stop being a dork. <laughs> We're creating whether we like it or not. Do you see? You have created, whether you like your life or not, you have created it up to this moment. 
And right now, watch, in your comfort zone, you conform to the masses and what they're doing. Watching TV, watching sports, playing video games. And you conform to their thought patterns and you become just like them. It's just like the animals. I was walking the other day, just taking a walk down the, down the thing. I had this thought. It was so divine. I was walking. I looked over in the bushes, and there was a brown rabbit. I could barely see it because the color of the rabbit was blending into the bushes. I walked a little further, and I saw a little lizard. The lizard was up in the green palm tree, and the lizard was green, and all I could see is this little mouth with this little red tongue going out. And I saw this little red lizard. It, it had blended into its environment, you see. God created animals. He gave them the ability for their bodies to change colors and to blend into the environment so it fits inside the environment. But see, when God created us, <laughs> he never created any of us with the color to blend into nothing. As a matter of fact, he created us to stand out. Not to conform, but to what? To stand out. Not to look at the environment and say, how can I fit in? But God created us to create our own environment. <laughs> oh, yeah. For us to produce our own paradise or our own hell. But it is up to you. Because God gave you a tool. The only thing you need to create is an imagination. All you've got to do, your responsibility, is to picture it in your mind. That's all you got to do. That's what, it, that's what imagination does. Imag image, you have the ability. Right now, you can close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Close your eyes. And let's just do something really easy. See yourself right now. See yourself in a house that's twice as big as yours. How many of you see it? Raise your hand. Can you see it? Now, did that cost you anything? <laughs> it didn't cost you anything? No, it didn't cost you anything to create a picture in your mind of a bigger house, a nicer car. Close your eyes. See yourself speaking on stage and people coming to hear you. Can you see that? Yeah, it didn't cost you anything. But imagination, it's your tool. Now, if I have a tool and I don't use it, whose fault is it? It's yours. And so many people, God has given us this wonderful tool called imagination, and yet they never realize that they have that wonderful tool and they never use the tool. So guess what? Their lives stay stuck or your life goes really slow. You keep coming to church, you love God, you pay your tithes, you worship, you pray, you praise, but it feels like, <laughs> Dr. Keith, it's, <laughs> it's so slow, man. <laughs> help me, Lord, help me, Lord. And when life goes slow, there's a bigger chance you'll give up. That's why the church is full of quitters. Because it's taken so long, but God gave us the tools. And once you got the tool, acceleration happens. It's like Tony, if I was looking at this picture over here. If Tony, Pastor Tony said, hang that picture up, Dr. Keith. And all he gave me was a nail. I mean, and I didn't know there was a thing called a hammer. I'd be like, how am I going to get this nail into that wall that has a two by four going across it? Now, I, now, he just leaves me. And, and I'm like, how am I going to do that? I have no tool. So I'm like, hey, I take my hands and try to pound it in. I take my head and try to pound it in. A week later, Tony comes back. Blood's running down my face. I got holes in my hands. And Tony looks, Pastor Tony looks and says, Kate, why is it the picture hung up? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm working on it, man. I'm working. He said, why are you so slow? Well, I don't know. Now, what would you tell me? What would you tell me? What would you say? You'd probably, you'd probably be like my coach and say, hey, dingbat, won't you use a what? 
a hammer, a hammer, oh, a hammer. Is that all I need? That's all you need? Wow. And then I take the hammer. Once I use the tool, what happens? My life goes from taking me two weeks to get nowhere to one second to what? Bam, the nail is in. And see, it's the same way in your life. Some of you, you have not been using your imagination. You have not been using it because you've been living out of your memories instead of living out of your imagination. And God says, in the beginning, I created. You have the ability to take your life no matter where it's at right now. And all of us hear it at different phases of our life. But we were built for progress and you're only happy when you're progressing in life when you're moving forward. And all of us have this thing to be able to progress. And the challenge came to me with, with my coach. He said, Keith, I want you to see your life 10 times bigger. 10 times. And, and I felt that, I've been speaking to this now for the last couple of weeks. I've been telling people, it's time for you to see your life 10 times bigger. See, I believe 2017 can be the best year of your life. I believe that 2017 could be an explosive year of growth for this church, an explosive year of growth for your finances, an explosive year of growth for transformation in your life. How many of you believe that? Say, oh, yes. Oh, yes. But it starts today. It begins with you imagining that everything in your life gets 10 times bigger. When Bob told me that, I, I was like, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be honest with you? I went back home, and I'm like, I can't see it. I can't, I, I, can't, I can't imagine myself speaking to that many people. To, I can't imagine my income being that much money. What, what would I do with all that money? And I, I'm, like, I'm like struggling. I'm like, I, and I, in my mind, you see, watch this. My heart said yes. My mind came up with all the reasons why it can't happen. But watch. All you're responsible for is to put the picture in. And then watch and believe that it's possible. Everybody say, it's possible. One more time, say, it's possible. Now unto him who believes all things are what? possible. So you got to picture what you want to see your future look like, and then you got to believe. Everybody say believe. believe. You got to believe. Yes, it's possible. If it's possible for a guy who flunked kindergarten, it's possible for me. If it's possible, come on, somebody help me possible for a guy who was born with Satan's escorts as his father, then I can do it too. If it's possible for anybody in the world, yes, I can. I can do it too. Right. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Once you put the picture in with your imagination, you believe. See, some of you are trying to figure things out, then you'll believe. You're trying to figure things out, then you'll imagine. That's not your responsibility. That's not how you were designed. God first imagined before he created anything. That's all you got to do is just imagine and believe that it's possible. And then watch this, watch this. Then you are wired by God that once you see it, you believe it's possible you are wired by God to then design a roadmap on exactly how to bring that life to pass. Oh. Yeah, it'll come. And some of you have to realize that that's a simple little process that you have to go through. But some of you are chicken. Boop, 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 boop. You're chicken. You're chicken to believe because you've been disappointed so many times. And you know what? It's easier. I know. I've been there. I, I've had life punch me in the face so many times. Where's our piano player? Would someone, would the piano player come, whoever she is? I like what Mike Tyson said. He 
He says, all men have a dream. And then life punches them in the face. <laughs> How many of you feel like life punched you in the face a couple times, huh? Come on, can we be honest? And you know, after so many punches in the face, I call them all the D's. D's coming. Life is going to punch you, man. It's going to punch you hard. Divorce. I never thought I'd have a divorce, but didn't even believe in divorce, but whoa. Disease. You hear the word cancer. Never forget when I walked into my dentist two years ago, took a picture of my jaw, natural routine procedures, checking out my teeth, and they looked and they said, Mr. Johnson, you need to get to the oral surgeon now. I'm like, what? Your entire jaw is eaten away. And you only have one piece of bone holding your jaw together. And if anybody just slaps you, your jaw is broken. I went down to the oral surgeon. The oral surgeon looked at it. And he said, he said to me, he looked at me, he said, Mr. Johnson, what do you do? I said, I'm a speaker. I speak all over the world. And when I said that, I was at the height of my career. And when I, when I said that, his face dropped. He says, oh, no. I said, what? He said, you have a rare jaw cancer that, that when you, if you get it, it's almost unstoppable. And 90% of the patients, this cancer will eat your whole face away. Because usually we can't stop it. Once we cut in, it is. It just explodes. And I'm like, wow. I mean, phew. whoa. I'm thinking, this is my life. This is what I love to do. I went back in my car. My wife was there. I'm like, what? The, next, the other day, I was planning for the next six months of, of travel, and now I'm he said, you, you, you got to get operated on. It's almost Christmas time. I, I, New Year's, Christmas Eve. I had to go in for surgery. Tear, I had a little tears came down my face. And I struggled for a moment. But as I went home, I realized my confidence was being tested. And I said, you know what? Fine. Even at worst case scenario, if my whole face gets eaten, ac eaten across the side, I'll still stand on stage with a half-eaten face. And I'll tell everybody, don't let go of your confidence. God, keep dreaming. God can still use you no matter what your disabilities are. Come on now, somebody help me right there, right? <laughs> Divorce, disease, debt, your kids acting up, get on drugs, doing crazy things. <laughs> things don't turn out like they want. Bankruptcies, failed businesses. <laughs> and if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you can let go of the dream what I did in my mother-in-law's house I realized it and I looked at my wife one day and I said honey I said I'm I'm a failure I'm stupid I'm ugly I'll never amount to nothing my wife looked at me and said you listen to me right now I said yes ma'am yes ma'am she said number one I don't marry failures I'm like whoa she said number two no person is a failure failure is not a person failure is an event that's all it is and every person has to go through failure to get to their dream. I'm like, whoa. That's why I've been married to that chick for 25 years. Celebrating 25 this year. Yeah, 25. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to get hit in the face by life. 
But let me tell you something. That's when you got to sustain the dream in your imagination. You got to sustain that dream in your imagination over a period of time. You've got to hold on to it in your imagination no matter what's going on. And most people do what? They let go. And they give up and they settle. And they say, you know what? It's better not to dream because I will never get disappointed. And as soon as you do that, you have lost the confidence test. You have failed. But here's the good news. You can pick it back up. I said you can pick it back up. And it's time today, I believe. I believe some of you, life has come at you. Life has punched you. And and you're confused. And all you need to do, and all God has sent me here to say to you, dream again. Ignite that imagination again. Resurface those dreams. Bring them back to the surface again and start holding on. Abraham, I'm going to give you a land as far as your eye can see. Abraham, you're going to have to hold on to that vision. You're going to have to hold on to what you see on the inside, not what you see on the outside. If you're here today, say, Dr. Keith, man, whoo, life has punched me in the face. And I have to admit, man, I haven't been living in my imagination. I've been living in memories and frustration and disappointment. And today, I'm going to start dreaming again. I'm going to start reimagining and believing that my life's going 10 times. I want you to pray for me. If that's you, on the count of three, I just want you to stand. One, two, three. Just stand up on your feet. I want to I pray for you. I want to pray for those of you here today. I believe God is moving. God is speaking God is healing hearts. I'm telling you, within this message, God is healing some of your hearts of the pain of the punches. The pain of the punches. Just lift your hand. Lift your hand. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit right now is moving in your heart to heal the pain. I know it hurts, but God is the healer of broken hearts. God is the healer of broken hearts. As you lift those hands, just let it go. Let go of the frustration. Let go of the anger. Let go. Let, let it go. Let, let it go. Just let it go. Like that song said, our sweet, it's well with my soul. I'm going to let it go. My soul is fine. I'm going to let it go. There it goes. Just let it go. Now, Father, his hands are raised. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, for revelation to explode in their spirit over these next few months. Thank you, Father, that you're sanctifying their imaginations. You said, you said, <laughs> you said these men, if they want to build a tower to heaven, there's nothing they could set their mind to do that they couldn't do. They were doing it for evil, but God, if we do it for righteous reasons, you will we do great things. So, Father, I just pray over each person that you will heal them, restore them, and that Lord, they will they will fire up their imagination. And that the fire of God will begin to burn in their belly again for their destiny, your overall desire for their life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Can you put your hands together, please? Yes, yes, yes.